Thank you. So I lied. We're not going to be talking about SaaS today. We are going to be talking about process metrics, hacks and tactics that you can use, processes that we've been using with our clients for the last nine years. But they're not just applicable to software as a service businesses. They're applicable whether you sell a product on subscription or even whether you sell a particularly complex product and a more involved purchase. The process that we use with every client that we work with, whether we're working with Facebook or Citrix or The Guardian newspaper, is exactly the same. And this is the model that we use. We talk about this in the same way that we have Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we looked at yesterday, in that the temptation for most people, especially when they're starting out in conversion optimization, is to dive in straight at the top. They see a case study, they see an example in a presentation at a conference like this, and they think, yep, I'm going to take that away. I'll try that tomorrow. They skip everything underneath that testing layer, and they drive straight in with the first test. But as we'll see in a minute, it's crucial to work out what the goals are that we need to optimize for. And I appreciate that sounds very simplistic to say. But in particular, for SaaS businesses, working out what that goal is is fundamental to your optimization program. Because when you have that, then you can look at the KPIs. Again, that can be more compli complex than it first appears. And when you know what the KPIs are, then you can start to gather the data that will support that, that will show you where the opportunities are. And then you can gather the insight that will tell you why people are dropping out. And then finally, you can put it into the strategy and the testing. So to start with, we're going to be looking at the goals. Like I say, this is a little bit more complex than it first appears. I want to take you back to January 2014. We just signed Citrix over in Santa Barbara in California. We were at their office. We were doing the kickoff meeting. And we wanted to find out from them what is it that stops your customers converting? We have a very simplified view of conversion optimization. You only need to do two things. Number one, work out why people aren't converting. Number two, fix it. You obviously can't do two without doing one first. So we asked a very simple question. Why aren't people converting? What is stopping someone from buying GoToMeeting after they've done a trial? And there were a lot of blank expressions in the room. People had a few different ideas, but no one really knew for sure. So we did a survey. Specifically, we phoned up five different types of people. This is what the homepage looked like at the time. It's not the prettiest looking homepage, I'll be honest. And we knew that people were signing up for a trial, but only a certain percentage of them were converting to a paying customer. So we spoke to five different segments of people. We wanted to talk to people who were doing a trial, whether they had used the product or not, whether they'd done a, their first online conference or not. We also spoke to people who had done a trial but then didn't buy. And we spoke to customers and lapsed customers. And we asked them very, very similar questions that we will do with all of our clients. What, essentially, what stopped you from taking a certain action? But ironically, it wasn't that question that got us the most value. The most important question that we asked them was, if you could make one change to the product, what would it be? And normally, we don't get involved in these kind of product questions. Typically, we will focus on their motivation, their behavior. But we were interested to find this out. We wanted to see if it was a product problem that we were trying to fix. And it was kind of bizarre, because the response to this was the most popular product feature request for GoToMeeting was video conferencing, which is kind of weird, because GoToMeeting is a video conferencing product. <laughs> this is the equivalent of saying, I really like Zappos.com, but I'd love it even more if they sold shoes. It, it doesn't make any sense. And what we realized is people were signing up for a trial, but they didn't know what they were doing. But this wasn't the customer's problem. The customer is not the dog in the photo here. We are the, we are the dog. We are the problem. We didn't know what we were doing. People were signing up for the product. And if they didn't know what they were signing up for, that was our problem. What we found was people were landing on this page. They were thinking, holy shit, this looks awful. I want to get off this page as quickly as possible. And they were doing one of two things. One, they were clicking the X, and they were leaving the page straight away. Or they were clicking the nice orange Try It Free button that you can't see at the back to sign up for a free trial, because at least they kind of know what that is and what they're going to get. 
Then they would land on this page. It's very easy to complete this. You don't have to put it in a credit card. And they would have signed up. The problem with this is that they were signing up without knowing what they were signing up for. So we did test number one, a very, very simple test. We are not going to win any awards for this. But it was based on a ton of user research. So we said, this is exactly what you'll get in the trial. And here's a little bit of social proof, because everyone's read Cialdini. And what we found is that this increased sales 19%. And I'm choosing my words very carefully. It increased sales 19%. It had zero impact on trials. So adding that panel in the right didn't make anyone more likely to fill out this form. What it did do is make them more likely to use the product, because they actually knew what it was. And this is super important. So the first principle that we want to see is we shouldn't focus on free trials if we're doing SaaS optimization or any kind of subscription optimization. And the equivalent in retail is focusing on add to cart instead of sales. We need to focus end to end. But in SaaS in particular, that can pose a problem. So let me give you another example. Zendesk, this is their website. Businesses are made of relationships. Put your hand up if you have never heard of Zendesk before. OK, a handful of people. Now put your hands down if you know exactly what they do now. That's the thing. This page, it's very pretty to look at. It speaks in marketing speak as opposed to good, effective copywriting speak. I don't know what the headline means, but I can see two calls to action. Relationships are complicated. Again, I don't know what that means, and I don't know where that will take me. And it includes the word complicated, and I don't like that. Or try Zendesk for free. And that feels kind of nice. So I click on that, and I land on a page that looks completely different. <laughs> so the steampunk diver and the astronaut have turned into a cartoon Buddha. <laughs> I'm not too sure what is going on here, but I can sign up in one click, so eh, maybe I will. And this is a problem, because what we're doing, in, if we're doing this, is we are making it very easy for someone to sign up for a trial but we're not focusing on the end goal, which is to get them to convert into being a paying and retained user. This in itself poses another problem, especially with SaaS products, because we can't focus on optimization as a kind of relay race. We can't say, first we need to get someone to sign up for a trial, then we need to make them pay, then we need to keep them, then we need to upsell them. We can't look at it in those individual stages in isolation. We have to focus in a much more long-term view. But that can be problematic for SaaS. So let's look at the KPIs that we use when we have that goal in mind. Because there's a problem here. Unlike a retail business, for example, where someone will typically transact in that same session, or maybe in two sessions, in SaaS, you will normally have a 14-day or a 30-day free trial. So if someone comes to your website today and they sign up for a free trial, we won't know until the end of April whether that person is going to convert into a paying customer or not. And so that means if we're doing a split test, we don't know for another month whether the people on day one of the, of the test converted through to a sale. And obviously, that's going to be problematic if we're trying to run a number of split tests. So how do we get around that? To answer that, we have to run through the, the typical metrics that we're looking at in a SaaS flow. So stage one, we want to acquire the visitor. We want to get them to sign up for a trial. Step two, we have to activate them. We have to get them to use the product. Then we have to monetize them. Typically, this is 14 to 30 days later. This flow is already becoming incredibly complicated. It's lasting multiple sessions, multiple days, multiple platforms even, or devices. People are often looking at their email as well as the website, as well as the product. It may even involve multiple people in the case of GoToMeeting. Very few people have a conference call on their own. Then we have to retain the user, ideally upsell them, and possibly even get them to refer other users. So we have a very complicated flow. And we have that question, if we do a split test today, what should our goal be? And there are four options. We've looked at the first option already, which is visit to trial. It's very easy to do. Someone comes to our website, they come to Daily Burn, they fill out the form, they start their trial, we're done. The downside of that is it doesn't always correlate to sales. It's kind of like having a PPC campaign and measuring it based on click-through rate instead of conversion rate. The two don't always go hand in hand. And we've seen option two as well, visit through to sale. Again, someone comes to your website, 
They sign up for a trial, and then 30 days later, they convert. This too can be problematic, excuse me, because we're increasing the test duration. So there are two better alternatives that we can look at. Number three is a visit through to a qualified trial. And what I mean by that is applying a lead scoring process the second someone signs up for a trial, using the data that we can gather from the form, the data that the customer gives you about themselves, to infer whether that person is likely to sign up to being a paying customer. Let me give you an example. Go to meeting, know that the email address that you use to sign up correlates to whether you'll become a paying customer or not. So if I fill out that email address field with my Gmail address, I am less likely to sign up to being a paying customer than if I use my conversion.com address. So they can apply a very simple lead scoring model that gives them a slightly better handle on whether people are going to convert into being a paying customer. The downside of that is that you have to develop this lead scoring model, and it doesn't always apply in every business. So option four is where we've seen the most value, a visit through to an active user. So if you are optimizing or VWO, it's not just someone signing up, it's someone creating a test or launching a test. Or if you're go-to-meeting, it's someone doing that first call. And that is a goal that is highly correlated to whether someone will become a paying customer or not. And yes, the action needs to happen within one to two days, but for almost every SaaS business that we've worked on, that will be the case in 80 to 90% of the time. So always test through to active trials. Excuse me. And this idea of action is super important, especially in SaaS businesses or any subscription business. We need to focus on the action that a user takes. So if we skip to the top of the pyramid now, we can start to talk about specific strategies and tactics that we can use. And I want to keep that idea of action in mind. The moment that we're looking for with every customer that we sign up is called the aha moment. That moment when they think, this is the solution that I've been looking for. This is the product that is going to fix my problem. It is a product that I've been looking for, the one that I am going to integrate into my daily routine or my weekly routine. We're looking for the aha moment because as soon as someone hits that point, they are significantly more likely to become a paying customer and to stay a paying customer. Essentially, that aha moment is the tipping point for retention. And I want to just take a quick detour to focus on retention because that is super important in SaaS businesses. Retention is the idea that you keep the customers that you have and nobody churns, or as few people as possible churn. So in this graph, we have a very simple example. We are signing up 100 new customers every single month, but also every, th every single month, we lose 3% of the total. And you can see what happens. With a 3% churn, it will start to level out over time. You can see that curve emerging. But if you dial that up from 3% to 6%, which doesn't sound like an awful lot, you can see it leveling off much faster. And if you go up to 10%, you can see it's going to flatline. And when you hit that point, you're essentially paying money to acquire new users just to stay still. So we need to make sure that we have retention fixed before we focus on acquisition. And the way to do that is to focus on that aha moment. And the best example of this is Facebook. They found out about eight, nine years ago in their growth team that there was a high degree of correlation between the number of friends someone has when they sign up for Facebook and their likelihood to stay a long-term user of the product. Specifically, that number was around 19, 20, 21 friends. In other words, if two people sign up today, and by the end of the day, one person has five friends and the other person has 20 friends, that second person is significantly more likely to stay a long-term user of Facebook. And so Chamath, who headed up the growth team at the time, said knowing this allowed us to do a lot to get new user users to that aha moment quickly. In other words, rather than focusing on getting people to fill out their profile, uploading a ton of photos, sharing their interests and so on, they could focus on how do we get this person to 20 friends as quickly as possible. As soon as you do that, you reach that aha moment much quicker. So let's take a look at a, a more recent example. Duolingo. This is their homepage. It's very, very simple. 
There's not a lot going on, but it's very persuasive. Learn a language for free forever. And a nice, happy, green call to action. Get started. What Duolingo is doing is they're putting that aha moment ahead of the registration form. So on this page, you can't even sign up. There is no sign up button. You can't register to use a product anywhere above the fold. So instead, you click on that button, get started. You are dumped straight into the product itself. You say, OK, I want to learn Spanish. Select the translation of the man. You're put straight into the product. You may not speak Spanish. You can probably guess that the photo of the man is also the Spanish for the man. It's not very hard to do. But they're starting to get you to use a product. They're showing you this is how it works. This is how simple it is. And then after a couple of minutes, they say, maybe you should save your progress. Nobody comes to your website because they want to register or because they want to sign up. They want to get that benefit, that end result. And so Duolingo is positioning this as a benefit. They're positioning this in line with your motivation. And so that's why they can make it very easy for people to sign up, and they will willingly do so. So deliver that aha moment as quickly as you can, and ideally before the user signs up. So I want to talk through a couple of specific tactics that we see working extremely well in SaaS. So these last two tactics have delivered between 40 to 100% in uplift in new revenue for every SaaS business that we work on, between 40 and 100%. So we looked at daily burn earlier. There's this challenge that a lot, a lot of SaaS companies face, and we saw it yesterday with um, Vertical Response, the email platform, in that it's hard to know what kind of audience they're selling to. Is it small business or medium business? There are all these kind of questions. There's a problem when you're selling to a diverse audience. If you can't infer from the visitor data who you are selling to, you have to try and create this one-size-fits-all approach. And Daily Burn is a good example of this. Because Daily Burn, they sell exercise videos. And exercise is probably one of the most polarizing types of product to sell. Because one person will sign up for Daily Burn because they want to lose weight. Someone else will sign up because they want to gain weight. One person might sign up because they're getting married in a year's time and they want to look good on their wedding day. Another person is signing up because they just got divorced and they want to get back at their ex. You have very different motivations at play here. And you have to create a one-size-fits-all approach. But there's a better way to do this. So this is an example from the UK. In just one second. Sorry, I did this slide last night after seeing Talia's presentation. The problem is, if you're selling, if you're focused on the product, the product will always stay the same. But this is what we should be selling. The awesome person who can do rad shit. The problem is, that person is always going to be different depending on the segment that you are selling to. So whereas the product stays the same, the business will vary. And so we need to understand what that segment should be. So let me give you that example from the UK that I promised you. This is a company called Naked Wines. They do a wine delivery service on subscription. My wife loves it. It allows you to get a box of wine delivered as often as you want. And they do a very clever thing on their homepage. Take our quick survey and get a free 30 pound wine voucher. Caution, Naked Wines is not for everybody. Find out if it's for you, it takes 43 seconds. Sounds kind of intriguing. It doesn't sound like we have to put a lot into it. Let's give it a go. They are building their sales mechanism around a Q&A system. It is super effective. Would you rather buy your food at a supermarket or a farmer's market? Would you rather buy your coffee at Starbucks or an independent roaster? They're doing a number of subtle things here. They're trying to build an affinity with the brand. They're saying, you are like us. We are different to everybody else. We are a little bit smarter than them. This is what we are like. But also what they're doing in asking you these questions is they're saying, what kind of a person are you? How do you choose your wine? What is important to you when you're looking at products? So they're using this system both to sell to you, to say, this is what Naked Wines is all about. This is what is important to us. But they're also learning from you what is important to you. And that means you can customize your email marketing, your landing pages, much more effectively to them. So if you run that exercise video website, you can then personalize it to say, OK, we know that you are 
a man and that you're looking to gain weight, we will give you a very different experience to someone who is looking to lose weight. And so at the end of this process, what a surprise. You've got a 30 pound voucher. So in 43 seconds, they have sold you on who they are and what their benefits are. They've found out who you are and what's important to you and how you should market and how we should market to you. And also you've invested a little bit of time and now you've been rewarded for that. If you go back three, four years, they probably just gave the 30 pound voucher away to everybody for free on step one without bothering with the Q&A. But by putting people through this process, they're gonna appreciate the reward that much better. So using Q&A is one of the most effective techniques that we see, especially for complex products. So vertical response, for example, could say, are you a, or take 43 seconds and we'll tell you if vertical response is right for you. It might not be. You make it look like you're the trustworthy advisor. Are you a small, medium, large business? Do you like designing every email that you send from scratch? Or do you want a library of 80 ready to go beautiful templates? This next technique is super effective. This is one that has been spoken about a little bit so far, and it's focusing on price and the psychology behind that. So we're looking at the plans page that we see on most SaaS businesses. There's a lot of best practice around this, including from Pep himself, who apparently has a blog, I've been told. There's a ton of best practice that you can find on this, but I don't want to talk about best practice. I want to talk specifically about wine again. There's a little bit of a theme emerging here. Specifically two bottles. We have a cheap and nasty bottle for $6.99 and a slightly better bottle for $9.99. In our store, we only sell two bottles of wine. We don't have the biggest inventory. And we find that sales looks a little bit like this. Significantly more people are buying the cheap and nasty bottle than the slightly more expensive bottle. We have a problem. We want to increase profit in the business. So we have five different options. There are five things that we can do. Number one, we can increase the price of the cheaper bottle. Most people are buying that, let's put the price up a dollar. Or we can decrease the price of the more expensive bottle. See if we can pull a few more people over to it. We can change the last digit to seven instead of nine because seven is a magic number and it makes people instantly convert. I'm being slightly sarcastic. Uh, we can offer 10% off if you buy three or more. Or we can do something else. I appreciate it is 4.40 on day two, so I'm gonna ask you to vote. You have to extend your arm in the air. So votes for number one, please. Thank you, Pep. Votes for number two. Three? Four? Five? So keep your hand in the air if you said five. Please bend it at the elbow. Pat yourself on the back because you were paying attention yesterday. <laughs> Roger Dooley, nice man that he is, used the same example only yesterday. You want to do something else? Introducing a third bottle of wine for 19.99. Because what you'll find when you do this is it shifts how people perceive the other prices. And often, it can pull the pricing up. So let me give you an example of this that we've done in the wild. Um, this is a very good book, by the way. Roger mentioned this yesterday as well. Please buy it and read it. So this is one example that we did with the client of ours. They had three plans. One is free, one is three pounds, one is six pounds a month. We added a variation, which is nine pounds a month. This plan didn't exist. It wasn't a real thing. We just wanted to do it to see what would happen. And if it works, we could build it. Revenue went up 40%. This is the quickest way that we've ever had an impact on a client for the least amount of effort. And what we find also is, let me just flick back to the last slide. This kind of layout is pretty typical. The more you spend, the more features you get. And that's typically how a lot of SaaS businesses will bill. The more you pay, the more features you get. So it looks a little bit like this. The other technique that we found is super effective is democratizing the features. So moving to a model like this. In every single plan, you get all of the features but we're using a numerical value, be it number of users, number of emails sent, to differentiate between the pricing models. Again, this is a little bit more complex to do because you actually have to build the product, but this in turn added 100% in sales overnight for new revenue. 
So those are some very, very quick examples, and we are on zero minutes exactly. Thank you.
Thank you, Stephen. A uh, couple of questions. How do you track unique user that saw a trial page experiment and then converted to more than a month later? Uh, any, so this is a bit of a technical thing? Yeah. Unique Good user question. ID in GA or something? So it depends on whatever system the client has in place at the time. Um, you can do it in GA. Most of the clients that we use in SAS will be using something like Mixpanel or an internal system. But you're absolutely right. When you're doing a split test, you should focus on the cohort. You want to assume that an active user will correlate to purchase, but you don't want to rely on that absolutely. So you should still measure and see what that cohort does over time so you can roll back a test if it is disastrous after the fact. Mm -hmm. OK. Sorry, does that make sense? Well, the question person will probably have to clarify with you if it didn't. Thank you. <laughs> okay, good, good. Um, how do you measure the aha moment? Any oh, KPIs? good question. Um, doing a ton of user testing. So showing the product to someone for the first time, getting them to say, or asking them the question like, when did you see value from the product? If you, can, if you can sit with the person when they start to use the product, it becomes much easier to see that. Or you can see that in the data. In other words, people who take a certain action, people who have 20 friends, are more likely to become a long-term user. I mean, with Facebook, actually, it became a little bit more complex than that in that they noticed as Facebook grew from 100 million DAUs to a billion DAUs, they saw that there was a variation in that. And some people actually didn't need to get to 20 friends. They only needed four, five, six. It would depend on how they used it. But you can use data, both quant and qual, to inform that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, what are your thoughts on scheduled demo uh, CTAs? leading the customer do their aha moment personally? Good question, Joel. Um, it can work. It, um, a lot of the time, scheduling a demo is a pain in the ass in that no one actually wants a demo. Demos are not normally things that people look forward to. Um, we try to find nicer ways to get someone to take um, what you could call micro conversions first. So rather than going all the way to a demo, which is quite which is perceived as being quite time intensive. Um, they feel like they're going to get a, um, a hard sell. They have to schedule a time. It's, a little, it's on someone else's terms rather than, than their terms. We look to sell that person in a number of incremental stages first so that they are more engaged with the product. But yes, you can absolutely do that. But we would look to um, engage them significantly more with the product first. Because otherwise, if it's either schedule a demo or bounce, a lot of people are going to go for the, the second option. Mm -hmm. Uh, two last questions. Sure. Uh, do you have a tool you recommend for lead scoring? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and it's, it's completely dependent on what your business is. So you need to, you need to analyze your own, your own data to see what that is. So it depends on what, what data the client is giving you. If they're only giving you an email address, you have that to go on. Are people with a Gmail address less likely to sign up than people with a, a non-Gmail, non-Hotmail, non, God forbid, AOL address? All right, and let's take the last one. Uh, when you added the third column for your client and revenue went up 40%, yep. what were people actually buying? They were buying a more expensive plan. So they weren't necessarily buying the higher plan. They were buying the, the, the middle option. So um, a slight TMI example, when I was in the restroom earlier, um, I went to the middle basin, and it was out of soap. The ones on either side, plenty of soap. The reason is that people will typically go for the option in the middle, especially if they can't decide on which one is going to be right for them. So providing that will shift how people perceive the, the pricing on a page. And so they don't necessarily want to go for the cheapest option. But in that wine example, like if you've got um, $6, $10, and $20, as soon as you have the $20 one, the $10 bottle doesn't look like the more expensive option anymore. It just looks like, oh, it's only $3 more than the cheap and nasty one. I'll go for that instead. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Ivar, can we see the most popular dog on the internet? There you go. That's him. All right. Uh, next up, we have John Ekman from uh, Scandinavia, Sweden. And uh, how many of you use uh, Spotify? Ooh, quite a bit. Any other music streaming services represented here? What do you use? Apple Music? Uh huh. OK, well, this is the guy that Spotify turns to for optimization. Uh, and uh, 
Uh, he's going to be talking to us about how to make sense of all the models that are available. Uh, there are quite many of them, uh, Research Excel and um, wider funnels models and um, lift model and so forth. He's going to try to make sense of them all. Let's see.